Hacking Dopamine. I'm Dr. Chris Masterjohn. I have a PhD in nutritional sciences. And today we are going to talk about optimizing cognitive performance without drugs. But we're going to start looking at a couple of drugs because we're going to compare the power of nutrition, which is way more powerful than drugs, to the power of drugs. And we're going to start with cocaine. And I'm going to talk from an angle that you may not be used to about cocaine. I'm going to talk about the possibility that cocaine would be able to improve productivity and efficiency. So what you can see on the screen is a description from Sigmund Freud in the late 1800s about coca, the plant native to the Andes from which cocaine is derived. And Freud had said that it wards off hunger, sleep, and fatigue and steals one to intellectual effort some dozens of times he had tried it on himself. And he furthermore wrote that a first dose or even repeated doses of coca produced no compulsive desire to use the stimulant further. Then Freud described a 78-year-old toxicologist, Sir Robert Christensen, who was world famous from the University of Edinburgh. And Freud said during the third experiment, he chewed two drums of coca leaves and was able to complete a 15-mile walk without exhaustion that he had experienced on the earlier occasions. When he arrived home, despite the fact that he had been nine hours without food or drink, he experienced no hunger or thirst and woke the next morning without feeling tired at all. Now, Freud's description is very reminiscent of how the natives of the Andes used coca leaves as described by the nutritional anthropologist Weston Price later in the 1930s. Price wrote that practically every Indian carries in a little pouch a quantity of these leaves in dried form. The effect of this drug is to increase their capacity for endurance. It makes them unconscious of hunger and fatigue. Through our interpreter, we frequently ask them regarding the comfort or nourishment they obtained from the leaves, and we're told that they often preferred these leaves to food when they were on a journey and carrying heavy loads. Price was informed that they could increase the quantity of the drug used to a point at which they are quite unconscious of pain and able to endure injuries without suffering and operations without discomfort. Now, granted, if you're isolating the active ingredient from the coca leaf and concentrating it, it's going to have a much more powerful effect. But you can see here that they are using it at drug-like levels if they are able to use it as anesthesia for surgery. And if we look to the first cocaine epidemic in the United States, which was in the late 1800s, cocaine had been isolated from coca leaf and the popular perception in America was that morphine was un-American because it made you lazy and tired while cocaine was positively American because it increased alertness and efficiency, which were much prized qualities in the time of industrialization. So we can see here that even isolated from the leaf, cocaine seemed to be pro-productivity, at least to many people. Now, Freud had never gone against isolated cocaine, but he did become against injectable cocaine when one of his friends induced a state of cocainist delirium before he died in 1891. And Freud went on to claim that cocaine even isolated from the leaf was a positive thing, but that when it was injected, it could become very dangerous in its addictive qualities and its other problematic psychiatric effects. Now, at that time, cocaine was used as an anesthetic in the same way that high-dose coca leaves were used as anesthetics by the natives of the Andes. So this suggests a similarity a common thread running through the coca leaf and cocaine where the cocaine had a much greater capacity to be overused and abused, but which had very similar quantities at the right dose as more likely to occur when chewing your way through many coca leaves to get it, where you have a self-regulating effect because the work you have to do to get that dose prevents you from getting to the overdose state too easily. And so that suggests that there's very much a dose-dependent effect where, and I do not advocate anyone use cocaine for productivity, but it does suggest that the active ingredient in the coca leaf and the cocaine can increase productivity when not abused. The problem with 
powdered cocaine is that it is so easily abused. Now, despite the possibility that cocaine could increase productivity, in the most often used context within an office, it would appear that cocaine was most used on Wall Street. And there's no evidence that anyone using cocaine on Wall Street increased their productivity. So for example, Jordan Belfort, the famous wolf, managed to crash a helicopter, crash his Mercedes into five other vehicles and sink a yacht, all while laundering money to Switzerland and performing pump and dump schemes to boost his own income. And jailed Ponzi schemer Bernie Madoff used to bring so much cocaine into his office, it was dubbed the North Pole, according to court papers. But the even though it was in the office, it probably was not used for productivity because Madoff would also throw in wild office parties sans spouses with topless entertainers wearing only G-string underwear serving as waitresses, which suggests that the cocaine was more used to party than to be productive. And then, of course, there's Larry Kudlow, who, according to a 1995 tell by New York Magazine, could have spent tens of thousands of dollars a month on his drug binges throughout the 80s and 90s. Rather than being more productive because of them, Kudlow was fired from Bear Stearns in 1994 for missing an important meeting because of a binge, entering rehab shortly thereafter. After a while, Kudlow got clean, and only after he got clean and found religion did he become the well-respected economic pundit that he is today. Now, fast forward to post-Great Financial Crisis, or GFC, Wall Street, and everyone is on Adderall instead. According to Kevin Roos, the author of Young Money, he expected a lot more drug use among the young bankers because of the stereotype is that they're all on cocaine all the time. But actually, the most common drug he heard about people using was Adderall. These people are not taking drugs, he said, to go out and party. They're taking drugs so that they can stay up longer and work more. Well, is it working? We're going to take a look at Adderall uh, and methylphenidate soon, but let's just get to the principles here. So these drugs, cocaine, Adderall, Ritalin, Provigil is another popular one used as a nootropic. It, Provigil is le much less well understood than these drugs. It kind of intersects heavily with these mechanisms to the extent anything is known about it. Uh, but these drugs are primarily acting on dopamine and norepinephrine. And dopamine provides a signal of value used for the subconscious calculation of whether a stimulus is worth investing energy in movement, attention, or the switching of psychological and emotional states. And norepinephrine can basically go in two modes depending on the signal of value provided by dopamine. So when dopamine is signaling that the thing you are doing has high value, then norepinephrine will be released in pulse phasic releases where it supports exploiting the task at hand. By contrast, if dopamine is signaling low value to the thing that your attention is currently on, then norepinephrine will go in a tonic continuous release and that will support exploring the alternatives. Now, if you don't have norepinephrine, you are neither exploiting the task at hand nor exploring alternatives, so you're probably going to be a lazy ass. But when you do have dopamine signaling the proper thing, you have norepinephrine doing one or the other, that will allow you to be productive by either exploiting your the task at hand to the fullest when it's high value or finding the next task when what you're currently on is low value. Now, under normal circumstances, so we can see how these drugs work, under normal circumstances, neurotransmitters such as dopamine and norepinephrine are stored in vesicles. This is inside the first neuron. So what we're seeing is two neurons here on the screen. The first neuron is going to release neurotransmitters that bind to receptors on the second neuron. The space between the two is the synapse, or um, or this, you could call this the synaptic space, etc. And in the synapse, in the connection between two neurons, is where neurotransmitters really do their thing. They release from one neuron and they act on receptors on the next, and a signal is thereby transmitted through one neuron to another. So this, this vesicles are on the inside of the first transmitting neuron. And all these green things in here are neurotransmitters. You could think of them as dopamine or norepinephrine. The, I made this figure to be blank so that it would suffice to show the principle for both of those neurotransmitters. And what will happen is the vesicle will release the neurotransmitters into the synaptic space 
they'll bind to a receptor for as long as they're needed, and then they'll be taken back up through a transporter. This is called reuptake, and then they'll be repackaged into the vesicle. And this is simplified. Other things can be happened to them. They could be broken down, for example. But this is the basic scheme of a generic recycling of a neurotransmitter. So what cocaine does is it blocks the reuptake of primarily dopamine into a lesser extent norepinephrine, which is signified by drawing the big red X over the reuptake transmitter and transporter. And what that is doing is massively increasing the amount of dopamine in the synapse. And as a result of that, it's massively increasing the subconscious calculation of value of the thing that you are doing at that moment. And that's why with enough coca leaf, you can <laughs> keep going up the, you know, for nine hours hiking up the difficult mountain without wanting any food because the value of climbing up that mountain being signified by the dopamine is saying you don't want to switch your attention to something else like stopping for food. But that, of course, also is what generates the potential for highly addictive properties to get that value back once it wears off. And of course, that can lead to for enormous potential for addiction with cocaine. If we look at if we look at any of the ADHD drugs they're doing, essentially the same thing. It's just that they tend to work more on dopamine and norepinephrine together. So what's shown on the screen is the effect of amphetamine, and there are a variety of isomers or prodrugs, et cetera, of amphetamine. But this basically applies to Adderall, Adderall XR, and Vyvanse. Vyvanse is the prodrug, and uh, at least anecdotally, it is more likely to lead to a stable benefit, uh, probably limited to, to ADHD type people. But um, because it's a pro drug, it, it leads to a more stable effect. In any case, they're all doing the same thing and they're all acting very similarly to cocaine, but it's just not exactly the same. So rather than blocking the reuptake transporter, what they are doing is, first of all, what they're actually doing is displacing the dopamine and norepinephrine from several sites. So they're displacing it in the storage vesicle, which prevents it from going into the storage vessel vesicle, makes it build up here, and then that essentially forces it to reverse transport out the transporter that would otherwise be involved in reuptake and spits it out into the synapse. So the end result is the same, which is that you have a massive elevation in synaptic dopamine. In this case, you also have the same, a similar effect in norepinephrine. Cocaine does not work as much on norepinephrine as it does on dopamine. The ADHD drugs tend to work on both uh, to a very significant degree. This is what methylphenidate does, which is Ritalin, Metadate, concert, Concerta, Daytrana, Focalin, Focalin XR, Methylin, etc. And this is basically doing the same thing as cocaine. It's just blocking the, the reuptake transporter, although... It again, it works more on norepinephrine and less exclusively on cocaine the way that, uh, excuse me, less specifically on dopamine the way that cocaine does. Now, if you look at illicit stimulus, stimulant use by college students, almost all of it is Adderall and methylphenidate. There is provigil or modafinil is third in line, but it's a very distant third, right? So Adderall is like number one, not even close. Ritalin is number two. It's very far away from Adderall, uh, but it's like, but it's very, very, very much higher than the next one down, which is modafinil or provigil, which is only used by two and a half percent of college students. And if you look in the lower right, what are they saying it does? Well, only 1% of them said that they were addicted to it and that's why they use it. There are some that say that on the right that they want to get high or they want to experiment, but the vast majority of them are reporting things like help with concentration, help, it helps me study, it increases my alertness. So there is a general perception among people who want to focus that these drugs are helping them focus even when they don't have ADHD. Now, the studies don't support that at all. So. What you're seeing on the screen here are results of a meta-analysis of amphetamine and methylphenidate 
And I'm going to cover these specifically because they're so much more popular than modafinil and provigil. And also because modafinil and provigil, the, the effects are almost certainly similar, but they are less well understood. But you can, if you go and look at these papers, uh, they cover provigil as well. And you'll essentially see that what I'm saying about Adderall and Ritalin more or less apply to, apply to provigil as well. Okay, so in order to understand these meta-analyses, we want to understand the concept of a standardized effects, uh, standardized mean difference. So the standardized mean difference is a method to normalize effect size comparisons across studies where the effect sizes are reported differently. And so, you know, one thing might say like 20% increase in whatever, but if they're measuring different, uh, like if they're using a different scale to measure working memory or recall or cognitive performance, et cetera, then one study's 20% increase might not be the same as another study's 20% increase. So the, the standardized mean, the standard mean difference is a way of normalizing all the studies that you're pulling together to each other so that you can summarize the effect size. And the way that this is interpreted, it's not as intuitively straightforward as 0.2 means a 20% increase. The way that it's interpreted is any any SMD or standardized standard mean difference, a point less than 0.2 means no effect. 0.2 to 0.5 means a small effect. 0.5 to 0.8 means a medium effect. And larger than 0.8 means a large effect. And if you look at cognitive performance in healthy adults who do not have ADHD, methylphenidate and amphetamine, so Ritalin and Adderall, both have SMDs in improving cognitive performance of 0.21. What does that mean? It means that it's just barely making the difference between no effect and a small effect. Now, by comparison, in 81 separate trials, meaning different trials than the ones we just covered, the SMDs for efficacy against ADHD and symptoms in children were negative 1.02 for amphetamines and 0.78 for methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, methylphenidate, is having a borderline large effect, and Adderall or amphetamine is having a large effect, right? So these drugs are very effective against ADHD symptoms in children diagnosed with ADHD, and they are borderline useless in adults for improving in healthy adults for improving cognitive performance. So if you find that it's improving your cognitive performance, it's, it's probably either fooling you or you have ADHD. Now, in terms of fooling you, this study showed that Adderall is more effective at fooling you into believing you have better cognitive performance than a placebo, right? So this is not the placebo effect because this is a placebo-controlled trial. So what they find? Despite the lack of enhancement observed for most measures and most participants, participants nevertheless believed their performance was more enhanced by the active capsule than by, than by the placebo. We conclude that mixed amphetamine salts, or Adderall, what has no more than small effects on cognition in healthy young adults, although users may perceive the drug as enhancing their cognition, right? So this is not the placebo effect. The placebo, compared to the placebo, Adderall made them more likely to believe their cognitive performance was enhanced. But compared to the placebo, Adderall did not make their cognitive performance enhanced, okay? So that suggests that Adderall has a legitimate non-placebo physiological effect on brain chemistry that makes you falsely believe your cognitive performance is enhanced. And, you know, if you go look on Reddit, you'll find anecdotes that are very consistent with that. Like people say, you put in 100% instead of 40%, but everyone else got the same results on 40%. You wasted your time. All right. Now, why would these drugs be so much more effective for ADHD than for a healthy adult limiting, uh, who's trying to improve their cognitive performance? If you look at the factors that are limiting attention in ADHD, they are not the factors that are limiting attention and cognitive performance in healthy adults. So in ADHD, we have a 3 to 5% smaller total brain size, and this is accounted for by decreased volume, especially in areas where dopamine controls the subconscious calculations of value that we've been talking about. And so what that essentially means is that ADHD, they're missing the dopamine neurons. 
Okay, that's not true outside of ADHD. Outside of ADHD, we're missing nutrients needed to produce neurotransmitters, nutrients needed to regulate neurotransmitters, and then there are a dramatic diversity in hundreds of idiosyncratic limitations. So we've got some low-hanging fruit that applies to all of us, and then we each have individual things that might limit our ability to regulate dopamine and norepinephrine in the right fashion to maximize our productivity. But we don't have the three to five percent smaller total brain size driven by loss of dopamine neurons that is found in ADHD brains. And so that's why when we look at what nutrition does, we're going to see something very nuanced and sophisticated in the balancing of dopamine in different pools. But when you look at what Adderall or cocaine or Ritalin are doing, they're just straight up increasing dopamine in the synapse, right? So if you're just missing the dopamine neurons, you can compensate for that by just getting more dopamine into the neurons that are there because the problem is absence of dopamine and you're fixing it with presence of dopamine. It's not the only problem, but that's – but that is – to to an extent, you can describe ADHD as just low dopamine. That is not how you describe someone who's having trouble, in, trouble focusing on the right things who is a healthy adult, an otherwise healthy adult. Okay, now the other thing is that these drugs come with a price. So in ADHD trials, children on methylphenidate were 44% more likely to drop out than those on the placebo and children on amphetamine were 2.3 times as likely. Now notice that notice that amphetamine or Adderall and its relatives are more effective than Ritalin and its, and its relatives and you see that in a proportionate increase in the side effects. Now, what's shown on the left is that there are many other drugs that are not primary ADHD drugs, but they still have some efficacy against ADHD, and they're all impacting norepinephrine and dopamine in similar ways, and they all impact ADHD symptoms in similar ways, and they all cause a similarly a similar battery of adverse effects related to too much dopamine and norepinephrine, such as insomnia, blood, increased blood pressure and heart rate, increased nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, ticks, appetite loss, body weight loss, and growth rate loss, and that includes healing from bone injuries, right? So you you break a bone, you're on these drugs, you will heal less effectively and it will take you longer to heal. That would be something like that would be included in growth and could impact an adult, whereas, you know, longitudinal growth getting taller is primarily going to impact children who are still growing, obviously. So we're also going to see why nutrition is not going to have this type of trade-off, this type of proportional risk to reward. Right? Nutrition is helping normalize the normal function of a homeostatic system that puts everything in its right place. The drug says, I don't care about everything being in its right place. I just want to put more dopamine here. And that's why the, why drugs have have – a completely different level of risk-reward ratio compared to nutrients. Now, on the side of nutrition, certainly health-conscious people are a lot less likely to use cocaine, and a lot of people now are using nootropic blends that are meant to improve cognitive performance. Alpha brain is one such nootropic, and it appears to be the only one that has a randomized control trial behind it. And you can see in here that there are some herbs and some supplements that are basically mostly meant to increase dopamine and norepinephrine, although there, some are also meant to increase acetylcholine, such as alpha-GPC. Uh, you can see uh, and the you know, there's some herbs that are meant to inhibit the breakdown of acetylcholine. There are some herbs that are meant to uh, stimulate dopamine presence in the synapse, and then there are amino acids that are precursors to dopamine. There are... Um, there are some other things that are calming and so on. But this is basically trying to provide the nutrients and raw materials to get a, a better – to get a more nutritional effect with a less high of a risk-reward ratio. But the evidence that alpha brain works is not very good. So if you look at this study, they emphasize that – one of the verbal scores was strongly increased by day 45 in the alpha brain compared to the placebo. But 
if you look at the paper, what they actually made were all the comparisons on the left. Now, I don't know. I don't want to go through all the comparisons on the left. The point is that there's a lot of them. And there's – so there's over – if I remember right, there's 25, uh, 26 comparisons, something like that. They don't adjust for making all those comparisons, which means that if you make 20 comparisons, chances are close to 100 percent that you're going to find something that's statistically significant at a P equals less than 0.05 level, which means that finding one finding that's significantly different does not provide any evidence of efficacy. So we'll come back to this in a little bit. I think part of the problem is that it's the dose, it's just trying to do many things in one product, too many things in one product that none of the doses are really up to snuff in terms of having real effects. But it's also the case that if you don't look at your individualized nutrition, you're a lot less likely to get the benefit, right? It's very hard to make one product that fits everyone. And I'm not saying it's easy for each person to figure out their own nutritional needs, but you have to do that if you really want to get the best results. So in order to understand the effect of nutrition, we have to talk about methylation. And methylation means the process of adding a methyl group to something. A methyl group is a single carbon atom, and it's the simplest way to add a single carbon atom to a molecule. Technically, it's a carbon atom with three hydrogens, but that's simply because when you add a methyl group to a molecule, all the extra binding sites are going to be occupied by hydrogen by nature. So this is the simplest way to add one carbon to a molecule, and methylation is also called one carbon metabolism. Methylation is especially important to creatine, which supports the brain's energy metabolism, to glycine, which is calming and promotes healthy sleep, to acetylcholine production, which is important for arousal upon waking, for learning and memory, for performance on tasks required sustained attention. And outside of the central nervous system, acetylcholine is also important for activating the parasympathetic nervous system and providing a calming effect and also for muscular contractions. It's actually used for muscular power when you contract your muscles. Dopamine, as we talked about before, is important for the calculation of value of the things that you are paying your attention to and investing your energy in. Histamine provides alertness. It's important for breaking away from conditioning and in excess it causes anxiety and panic attacks, which can be seen as anxiety can be seen as excessive alertness and panic attacks could be seen as a vicious loop of excessive alertness. Now there's two pools of dopamine in one way to conceptualize it, the tonic pool and the phasic pool. The tonic pool is stable over time. It forms the background against which phasic pulses of dopamine are read. It's analogous to sea level. So if you look out at the ocean, you are going, you know, and you don't see a wave, you have the fat, flat baseline. When you see a wave, which is analogous to a phasic pulse of dopamine that lasts only hundreds of milliseconds, you don't see the wave as – you don't see its size as from top to the bottom of the ocean floor. You see its size as from top to sea level. You see the degree to which the wave rises above the sea level. So the basic pulse of dopamine is interpreted the same way by your brain. When your brain sees that pulse, it says, OK, how much does this pulse rise above the background level? If you are a more mathematic type – you might think of this as the signal to noise ratio. So the phasic dopamine pulse is your signal. The tonic dopamine is your the tonic dopamine is your noise. And when you are looking at the signal to, to noise ratio, you are looking at the degree to which the phasic pulse rises above the background noise of the tonic dopamine pool. So when tonic dopamine and phasic do dopamine are in their proper balance, that's because you have properly balanced methylation and that leads to stability, flexibility, the right balance of stability and flexibility in your mind, which is mental health. If you have too much methylation, what happens is you break down the tonic dopamine but not the phasic dopamine. That makes the tonic dopamine pool shrink. That makes the phasic dopamine pool look bigger to the brain and this causes too much mental flexibility. That can lead to instability, hyperarousal, and distractibility. And if it gets pathological, you can think of this as being associated with impulse disorders or in extreme cases, flight of ideas and schizophrenia. 
if you have too much tonic dopamine because you don't have enough methylation, the background noise of the tonic dopamine pool is larger. So the facial pulses look smaller even when they're not. And that leads to pathological inflexibility, brittle mental states. So you can get stuck in one mental state. But when you need to transition, the transition can be very abrupt. And this could, you know, this can sometimes be the tension that leads to a fight, right? Because if you're interacting with someone and you see them starting to get annoyed, you might change how you're act, interacting with them so that you can prevent them from getting further annoyed. But if they look like poker face or they're happy and they're just – the happy face is glued on while they're getting upset, then you can push them over the edge without any warning because they don't have the flexibility to transition easily. They're stuck in one position and then the old, they can get thrown into another one very abruptly but they can't transition smoothly. But this also can simply be ruminating on ideas or emotions. Some, an image gets stuck in your mind and you cannot let it go. This can be from not having enough methylation. Now, you, you want to have proper mental health where you have 4,000 ideas coming through your head. You want to be able to grab onto one and let the others go based on their utility. You don't want to get – you don't want to be unable to focus on any of them and you don't want to get stuck on the ones that are producing anxiety or producing depression or producing distraction or producing things things that are simply not meeting your goals. Now, this is a functional MRI study looking at the effect of the catechol O-methyltransferase or COMT polymorphism where 25% of the population – have high COMT, 25% of the population have low COMT, and 50% are intermediate. COMT is using methyl groups. It's using the methylation system to methylate dopamine, and this is what reduces the tonic pool of dopamine, right? So high methylation means that you are mentally flexible. Low methylation means that you're mentally rigid, and this demonstrates that principle. So what they did was they took 56 healthy male and female subjects in their 20s and they subdivided them according to their COMT genotype. And then they exposed them to negative, unpleasant pictures. And they looked at the degree to which their emotional center in their brain, their amygdala, lit up. And for the high methylation and intermediate methylation, the amygdala didn't light up. Why? Because they saw the picture and they said, that's unpleasant. I don't want to think about it. But the low methylation people, the low COMT people, they had a massive increase in their amygdala lighting up. Why? Because they saw the unpleasant picture and they couldn't look at it and say, I don't want to think about that. They looked at it and they said, I cannot get that picture out of my head. This is distressing me. This is annoying me. This is hurting my feelings. And so the problem is not that they're more sensitive than the others. The problem is that they're not mentally flexible enough to let something go when they don't want to look at it. They see it once and it's stuck in their head. Now, another interesting concept is they, they looked at the functional connectivity between the amygdala and the orb orbitofrontal prefrontal cortex by the COMT genotype. And what they found was that in the low methylation phenotype, there was very strong connectivity. And what that meant was lighting up of the amygdala was causing the prefrontal cortex where you have executive control functions to light up. And the, the more amygdala lighting up they had, the more the more the prefrontal cortex lit up as well. And the interpretation here is that if you can't just let the thought go, you need to exhaust your executive control to try to forcefully get it out of your mind. So these people are saying, I should not be disturbed by this picture, but I am. I can't get it out of my head. I need to use my willpower to push this thing out of my head. And the problem with that is that you can get mentally exhausted from using all your executive control on your emotional stability, right? So you might not notice it. You might just think, why am I so unmotivated and exhausted? Why do I have brain fog? But what's really going on is that other people see thousands of negative influences that come into your, their ears, into their eyes, into their nose, and they let, they let it go. And you are constantly using up all your mental energy to separate yourself from the thoughts and feelings that you can't let go of. 
and that is leaving you exhausted. All right, so I mentioned all these creatine, acetylcholine, et cetera. I'm just going to show you a couple studies just to demonstrate the point that they're so important for the brain. So this is a randomized controlled trial that showed that creatine is more effective than a placebo in improving depression in 52 women with a diagnosis of major depression. And this demonstrates the importance of creatine to brain energy metabolism. This is a review of antihistamines being used to treat generalized anxiety disorder. This shows that histamine plays a role in anxiety, like I said before. This is a case series of people whose panic attacks disappeared when they want, went on a low histamine diet to solve histamine intolerance-driven itchiness. And on the left, you see some data on how when rats are given extra choline, three times the normal requirement during pregnancy, which is equivalent to humans feeding choline, uh, humans getting choline in the mother during pregnancy and lactation during the first four years of life, if you compare when the brain is developing, that leads to a lifelong 30% increase in visual, spatial, and auditory memory, the elimination of age-related senility, protection against neurotoxins. They're better at multitasking and they have a lower rate of interference memory, which is like, you went to the grocery store a hundred times and now you can't remember where you parked your car because you parked your car 99 other places at that same grocery store. On the right, you see data showing that 250 patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's type dementia were randomized to receive either a placebo or 1,200 milligrams per day of alpha DPC, a form of choline that's easily converted into acetylcholine for 180 days. And seven different indices of cognitive function all showed improvement with alpha DPC compared to placebo. If we go back to alpha brain, what I, you know, back to the point of why this didn't have a convincing effect, it's got 100 milligrams of alpha GPC in it, in two capsules, which is one serving. Go back to this study. What do they use for Alzheimer's type dementia? 1,200 milligrams, right? So it's one twelfth the dose. And that goes back to why I think this product, it's having difficulty getting an effect because rather than finding the people who need 1,200 milligrams of alpha GPC, it's giving everyone 100 milligrams of alpha GPC. So it's you know it's giving a bunch of people the alpha GPC who don't need it, and then when someone really needs it, it's giving them one twelfth the amount that they need. Glycine has been used as an antipsychotic in schizophrenics at 60 grams a day, and three grams of glycine before bed promotes sleep. These both show the importance of dietary glycine impacting the brain. And if you sum all these together, I think what they show is that if you support methylation, you get the benefits of all of these neurotransmitters and creatine, which is not a neurotransmitter, but which is an energy metabolism support nutrient. If you take an antihistamine, you slow your anxiety down, but you also get knocked out. <laughs> what happens if you take two Benadryl? You probably get out of your panic attack, but you probably fall asleep. So nutrition can make you more alert, sleep better, be more focused, be less distracted, but let go of the things that you don't want to think about. Right? Nutrition can do all of these things together because you are not forcing an outcome. You are giving the body the raw materials that it can take and put where they belong to get all the outcomes that it wants. If you're missing something as simple as a methyl group, you can lose all of these functions simultaneously. And if you try to make up for that with a drug, you're going to have to mix and match five different drugs to try to cover all these things, but then you're going to wind up with adverse drug interactions. So the appropriate thing to do is to start with nutrition because nutrition is powerful enough to come in with a very high reward, very low risk way to optimize all things simultaneously. All right. Now, to demonstrate the population level importance of these things, MTHFR is an enzyme that uses B vitamins to support the methylation process. Low MTHFR activity will lead to low synthesis of creatine low synthesis of acetylcholine, high tonic dopamine, high histamine, and loss of glycine in the urine. You know, if you don't have glycine, you're not going to sleep well. If you have high histamine, you're going to have high anxiety. If you have high tonic dopamine, thoughts are going to get stuck in your head. If you have low acetylcholine, you're not going to be able to focus and get sustained attention or form memories. And if you don't have creatine, you're going to get depressed, right? You lose one little part of the methylation system. All these things are going to go wrong. Now, if you look at the distribution of MTHFR activity in the population, the 
the diagram at the top, the table at the top basically shows you that it's pretty evenly distributed where only about 15% of people have full MTHFR activity, 85% activity, 85% of people have some degree of decrease. And it, that degree of decrease is fairly evenly spread across the population. Now, if you bring riboflavin up to three milligrams a day, most people are getting about a milligram and a half. And you could do this by eating liver, heart, kidneys, and almonds. All that MTHFR activity gets normalized. Right. So the reason this is so common is because on ancestral diets, we had that riboflavin and it didn't matter. On modern diets, we don't have enough riboflavin and all of a sudden this becomes so important. So you can be missing this little bit of riboflavin because you're eating modern foods instead of organ meats. And then all of a sudden, 85% of people have some degree of deficit in MTHFR activity and all of these neurotransmitters wind up going wrong. Something as simple as that. Now, if MTHFR and COMT are both evenly distributed among the population and highly impacted by nutrition, it follows that nutritional support for methylation would be a common, a common limiting factor for cognitive performance. So what are we going to do about it? Here's some low-hanging fruit. 80% of people do not get the RDA of magnesium. You can get magnesium, which you need for methylation, by consuming a large volume of unrefined plant foods, including whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, and vegetables. If you're a carnivore, it's harder. I have a guide see my substack, chrismasterjohn.substack.com, excuse me, chrismasterjohnphd.substack.com, click on ebooks, I got a guide doing carnivore right in the ebooks menu. Folates, two to three servings of liver, legumes, or dark greens per day provide adequate folate. You can supercharge this by using four-day sprouted legumes or pastured egg yolks. You want to be mindful that folate is not stable in the freezer except in liver, and about 40% of people do not get the RDA for folate. Creatine, if you get three to five grams of creatine per day, it can cut the methylation demand by about 45%. You can obtain creatine from one to two pounds of meat. So congratulations, carnivores. And protein also provides the amino acids that support methylation, such as methionine. On the right, we have five ways to get enough B12. We either want large amounts of meat and dairy, so three or four servings of meat and dairy per day. You can mix and match them. Or very small amounts of liver, oysters, or clams. That will do the trick for B12. There are There is some research on non-animal food sources of B12. Black trumpet and chanterelle mushrooms, green and purple nori, but none of the other foods. I'd be very careful if you're relying on them because there, we, need, we need more research to clarify that those are legit sources of, of B12 and don't carry significant risk of variation because we do know that B12 antagonists are, are found in mushrooms and seaweed. Now, about 15% of people over the age of 65 have B12 deficiency as a result of digestive problems, atrophic gastritis. A much smaller percentage have an autoimmune condition called pernicious anemia that will cause B12 deficiency. One thing you want to keep in mind is that you can eat a day's worth of B12 at every meal. You, you really can't concentrate it more than that. So you can't eat like a month's worth of B12. Like you could sit down and eat a gigantic amount of clams and you would get enough B12 for a month, but you will not absorb that much of it. But you will absorb a day's worth of B12 at each meal. And if you eat it a day's worth of B12 at each meal, then two-thirds of the B12 that you take, you're putting in a savings account and you can store up to 30 years of B12. So while you're young, if you stock up on B12 in that way, you can have a 30 year supply of B12 for when you're 65. It can, you can have zero B12 absorption until you're 95 before you run deficient. So you really, for the sake of the longevity of your mind, you want to stock up on B12 while you are young. Choline is most easily obtained from liver and egg yolks. There are you can screenshot this screen if you want to go th through it. I also have a choline database at chrismasterjohnphd.com. There are some plant foods that have betaine or trimethylglycine or TMG as an alternative. Quinoa, wheat germ, and wheat bran are very much at the top of that list. Glycine is primarily found in skin and bones. If we eat lean chicken breast, skinless boneless chicken breast, we're getting very little glycine 
the methionine that's in the chicken breast is actually increasing our need for glycine. So it's actually a net loss. If you eat the whole animal and you make stock from the bones every time you cook a chicken, you're getting a much better balance of amino acids, including a lot of glycine. But those are low-hanging fruit type key nutrients. Many other nutrients are important in methylation and the dopamine norepinephrine system. So dopamine is synthesized from the amino acid tyrosine, which is obtained from protein foods using zinc, copper, iron, salt, and B6. It's converted to norepinephrine using copper, iron, and vitamin C. All the regulation of synaptic concentrations of neurotransmitters depends on ATP production. Methylation is critically dependent on ATP as well. ATP production requires all of the B vitamins, all of the electrolytes, that's sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, and bicarbonate, iron, copper, sulfur, and molybdenum. Then on top of that, there are 1,451 genetic impairments in metabolism, each person having about one to six of them, and most of them have nutritionally actionable implications, such as the need to alter protein, fat, carbohydrate, vitamin, or mineral intake in highly unique ways. So the low-hanging fruit is to eat one-third of your pay plate as protein and to diversify your protein across meat, poultry, fish, shellfish, dairy, and eggs, to eat nose to tail or at least include four to eight ounces of liver per week and bone broth each day, to eat one third of your plate as red, orange, yellow, and green vegetables, always including some dark greens, to get several servings of calcium rich foods per day, such as dairy, bones, or cruciferous vegetables like kale and broccoli. And you can make a natural multivitamin if each day you include one or two ounces of liver, one or two oysters or clams, a tablespoon of nutritional yeast and a source of vitamin C such as bell peppers, that's going to ensure that you get most vitamins and minerals that you need from food. But the next step up the tree after the low-hanging fruit is to do nutritional status testing. So head over to chrismasterjohnphd.substack.com, click on ebooks in the menu, and you'll see testing nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet. This is my comprehensive system for managing nutritional status using signs and symptoms, dietary analysis, and lab tests. And you will also see my MTHFR protocol there, which focuses on the methylation system that we've been talking about today. Ultimately, improving energy metabolism to the fullest requires nutritional optimization around rare genetic bottlenecks. There's approximately 750 nutritionally actionable genetic disorders and energy metabolism that hurt the availability of ATP, which is needed to fuel methylation and is needed to regulate neurotransmitters with a distribution of about one to six per person. I said before 1,451, that's the total. Roughly 750 is the number that are highly nutritionally actionable, meaning you can do something about it with nutrition. You don't have to go all the way down your own genetic rabbit hole to get some progress. Some things that you can track at home are weight, waist circumference, your diet with an app like Chronometer, subjective health scores, whatever is important to you, put a number on it and track it each day, sleep with something like an Ura ring, glucose, ketones, and lactate. And you can test shifts in your macronutrients and your micronutrients one at a time or use a combination and use a combination of subjective and objective measures to judge whether each thing is helping or hurting. And if you use these, you can start to go in the correct direction of nutritional optimization around your own highly unique bottlenecks without necessarily having gone fully down the rabbit hole of figuring out what is the one or two things that are definitely driving those, right? So if you do your experiments right and you do one thing at a time, you carry it out till the time-dependent trend is finished and you know what it's doing, then you can start to accumulate knowledge of when I shift my macros like this, I experience effortless optimization of my body composition. It must be doing something right. I should keep eating like that. I'm going to now test the next thing to optimize me. But if you want a high precision way to find your own highly unique genetic super unlock, head over to chrismasterjohnphd.substack.com and check out the pinned article and video, How I Found My Health Super Unlock After 20 Years of Research and 20,000 Genes Tested. This is the high precision approach to actually going fully down that rabbit hole very quickly to get exactly what you need to optimize yourself. And so we have the drugs on the one hand that are very blunt force tools. They are not able to optimize many neurotransmitters at once. They are not able to deliver high reward with no risk. Once, you know, coca leaves do pretty well, or at least according to the, what we have, they did pretty well in their natural state in getting a high risk to reward ratio, but it still was not zero risk. And once they were isolated to a modern pharmaceutical type drug, then all of a sudden that risk reward becomes very proportional. You are trading your reward for your risk. 
Nutrients do not do this. They give your body what it needs to regulate all things simultaneously to put them in their proper places. It doesn't try to force an outcome in one corner playing whack-a-mole with something going wrong in a different corner. It puts the stuff into the system that the system needs to self-regulate. And so if you just do the low-hanging fruit with nutrition, you can get a very high risk to re- a very high reward to risk ratio for optimizing your cognitive performance. And but if we look at something like the Alpha Brain study, it looks like you can't just take a little bit of everything. You need to get all the nutrition that you need, and then you need to say, what am I missing? If I you know if I feel too mentally stable or rigid, maybe I need more methylation, and you need to try to up the up the supply of methyl donors and and things like that. You have to think a little bit about where your key bottlenecks are in your attention so you can kind of hack your way around it with doses that matter. And then you really, if you want to go to the next step, you really have to go to nutritional optimization with lab testing. And then if you really want to go all the way, you have to find that super unlock that is highly unique to you. And that, my friends, is how you hack dopamine to get cognitive performance optimized without drugs.